Here your next news update, 830, Chicago's Morning Answer, continues next on AM560, The Answer. Now, from the Signature Bank Studios, this is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy, uh, a uh, public service announcement of sorts here. Our friend Tom Sedeka, who was uh, the organizer of the uh, Rebel Lunch crew back during the shutdowns, supporting the restaurants that remained open in defiance of Jelly Belly and other COVIDians. Uh, Tom Sedeka uh, sent this to me. America's Wall of Honor is on the road gathering supplies to take to South Carolina. We're pulling out of Omaha in the morning, that's today, mm-hmm. with a stop in Rochelle, then on to Schaumburg. Trucks will roll into Schaumburg around 3 p.m. and roll out for South Carolina at 7 p.m., so 3 o'clock to 7 o'clock in Schaumburg if you want to support the effort. They're uh, staging at uh, in the parking lot behind Morton's Steakhouse in Schaumburg. So Morton's Steakhouse, Schaumburg, 3 to 7 p.m. today. Uh, items needed. Yeah, I was going to say, what do they need? Uh, no bottled water. They already have that, yeah. which is great. But the items needed, baby diapers, baby formula, non-perishable food, toothbrushes, toothpaste, feminine hygiene products, and generators. Um, so those are the items that they're looking for being taken down to South Carolina to help those who have been uh, terribly impacted by Helene. Uh, 3 o'clock to 7 o'clock, staging at the uh, parking lot behind Morton Steakhouse in Schaumburg. Okay. Good. Maybe we can have them on tomorrow and they can talk about what, you know, supplies they've received. And we're, we're helping Americans because our government is turned their back on them. Well, um, Hillary Clinton was on uh, Michael Smirkanish's show on CNN. If you're not familiar with it, Smirkanish is basically the only CNN host who would be found mentally fit to stand trial if he were charged with a criminal offense. Mm-hmm. And that's how I distinguish him from the rest of the lineup. Um, and uh, Hillary was uh, on the warpath again against the First Amendment. We really need to do something about that. She uh, has social media companies in her sites, as she has before, and many of her allies in this administration do as well. There should be a lot of things done. Uh, we should be, uh, in my view, repealing something called Section 230, which gave um, you know, platforms on the Internet uh, immunity because they were thought to be just pass-throughs, that they shouldn't be judged for the content that is posted. But we now know that that was an overly simple view, that if the platforms, whether it's Facebook or Twitter X or uh, Instagram or TikTok, whatever they are, if they don't moderate uh, and monitor the content, uh, we lose total control. We lose total control, forgetting the argument over Section 230 for the moment. We lose total control. The follow-up should have been, who is the we and of what control do you speak? For more on this, please be joined by Alex Berenson, author of Pandemia, How Coronavirus Hysteria Took Over Our Government Rights and Lives. His Substack, which is uh, more powerful than uh, a speeding bullet and certainly more powerful than uh, corporate media. Uh, He wrote about it. His Substack is Unreported Truths, alexberenson.substack.com. Alex, thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. So um, we lose control. Who is the we Hillary speaks of? Uh, well, you know, that's a, that's a really good question, right? It's it's her and her husband and all the, you know, right-thinking, uh, who, who are, of course, left-thinking people who, at the top of academia at the top of, you know, philanthropy, increasingly at the top of corporate America, all the people who know what's good for us and are going to shove it down our throats whether we like it or not. And and they're very frustrated with social media because they can't control it the way they control almost everything else. We keep hearing, I mean, uh, John Kerry just a couple weeks earlier at the at the World Economic Forum wanted to, was talking about outlets, news outlets that traffic in what he de- de- calls uh, misinformation, and we need to revisit the First Amendment very much like you hear people talking about revisiting the Second Amendment, which they usually mean to repeal the right enshrined in those amendments. And and my sense is that's largely what uh, they're telegraphing, the the John Kerry's and the Hillary Clinton's are telegraphing here. 
Uh, I mean, I, I, I think it's more than telegraphing. They're, they're, I don't know if they think that they could actually repeal the First Amendment, but they want certainly to make it functionally much less protective of, of our right to speak. And uh, they want the government to have a lot of influence over what's said on social media platforms. And I think the platforms actually are starting to, and X is its own place because Elon, you know, it's its owned by a, an individual who has his own views and does believe in free speech. But I, I, I think he's he's not running it from a point of view of sort of maximizing wealth for shareholders. But I think I think Facebook slash Meta has woken up to the danger of being put in this position of having to regulate. Uh, content and, you know, de- determine which political views are acceptable. And they've kind of realized they don't want to do it. And so they are, you know, they're fighting back a little bit publicly. And I think that that has annoyed, you know, John Kerry and, and Hillary Clinton and sort of the, the elite left. But then you have, you know, Elon Musk in charge of X, who is a Trump yes. supporter and was, you know, with him in Butler, Pennsylvania on Saturday. I mean, I mean, honestly, that's probably not ideal either. But I do think Elon has a sort of philosophical commitment to free speech. But what you can see with Elon and X is that X, you know, X got into a fight with Brazil, the country of Brazil, mm-hmm. and they really had to back down. Right? The, the, the companies are powerful, but when a national government of a big country decides it's going to target you, you have very little recourse as a, as a corporate entity. And that's why the First Amendment is so important, right? The First Amendment says that we, as Americans, have the right to speak without governmental interference. And, you know, there is a big and important fight happening right now, as to, and I'm part of it, right, with Berenson v. Biden, with my lawsuit against the federal government. When the federal government tries to lean on the companies, can it, can it do that? And how heavily can it lean on them? And can it do it in secret and target individual users in secret? I, I think I think it's a very complicated. There's, so there's one part of this that's very complicated, right? Which is, should the companies be forced to carry every piece of speech, just the way the telephone companies are forced to carry essentially every conversation? And that that is a, that is a, I, I can argue that both ways. But there's also a simpler question, which is, should the government be pushing companies to, to not carry? You know, individual users it finds repugnant, whoever is in power at that time, or ban individual posts that are legal but that it doesn't like. And the answer to that question is no. The federal government should not be involved in targeting individual users or or posts that, you know, are not clearly illegal. And so I, I think we should all agree on that, and I think the left should agree on that. Well, right. But the problem is that they sort of – you get to a popular agreement, at least majority agreement – on that conceptually, but despite the all the reporting of the Twitter files and despite your lawsuit that you referenced, you know, in practice, when it becomes somebody or something that uh, you can convince the majority is a threat to our democracy, all of a sudden they're willing to throw over uh, First Amendment protections for that person or that outlet, as we see with Trump. And, uh, you know, frankly, I mean, I hate to have such a low opinion of half the country, but um, half the country is susceptible to the sentimentalist argument of uh, this person bad or what this person said is dangerous. It's misinformation. And we over here are the repositories of the truth. And all we're trying to do is make sure people get the truth and are not subjected to the horror of what we say is misinformation. Right. Uh, yeah, that's I mean, that's the argument that the left is making openly. The problem is. As you, who are the elites? Who defines misinformation? This is, uh, I got banned from Twitter, right? So this is very personal to me. And I got banned from Twitter for a tweet that said, it doesn't stop infection or transmission. And we want to mandate it, it insanity. Okay. That was the tweet. I mean, there's a little bit more in it, but. But the core line was, it doesn't stop infection or transmission. How did that turn out? It, yeah, uh, right. How did, yeah, right. Who, who was right and wrong with that yeah. one? Who, that's right. Who had the misinformation about that? So so the, the corrective to speech is more speech. The corrective to hate speech is more speech. And letting people judge for themselves whether, you know, whether they think terrible ideologies are, are things they want to be associated with. That's, that's how this country was founded. That's what this country should believe in. And it's disgusting to me that these people think they know better. Well, how long did it take you to get your Twitter account back? So I, so I got back on in April of 2022, or I'm sorry, in, August, in July of 2022 after being banned in August of 2021. So it took me 11 months, and those 11 months were the mandate months. So I couldn't speak on that issue. And I know... 
I know there are people who got mandated who wouldn't have if I'd been able to speak up for them. I know that's true because some of them have told me. And so what I say about this, and it's true, is my rights were violated, but so were a lot of other people's when I was silenced. Um, I I love this uh, publication of this email exchange you had with an L.A. Times writer about (laughs) about a a pandemic conference at Stanford you were part of. I mean, just just the exchange, uh, if you could summarize with Michael Hiltzik over at the L.A. Times uh, about this conference and your participation in it and what it should tell us about corporate media. So, so Michael Hiltzik is a huge, uh, you know, mandate and lockdown proponent. And it's interesting, most people have forgotten this, but there are a few people on the left, just like there are a few people on the right who have not forgotten, and he has not forgotten, and he's still trying to silence people like me. And so he's, you know, he was very annoyed that Stanford, which obviously, you know, is a prestigious place, hosted a conference and allowed me to speak. And so he wrote me an email saying, basically, well, what did you say there? So it's like, first of all, buddy, I don't know, you know, this is, this is public. You can go look for yourself what I said. I don't have to defend myself to you. But if you're going to ask me, you know, am I have my opinion of the vaccines, the mRNA vaccines changed since 2021? Yeah, it sure has. It's gotten a lot worse. And by the way, at the beginning of 2022, you wrote an article saying, uh, hey, it, we should we should the deaths of anti-vaxxers should sometimes be mocked. That's basically what the article said. And that's what the headline said. Do you stand by that? And I actually got an email back from him, which became a subject of a su- second substack of mine, where he basically blamed the headline writer, which is, for those of you who are journalists, that's the oldest trick in the book. <laughs> oh, I didn't write that headline. That I, I, I don't agree with that. But he didn't even say I don't agree with that. So I guess Michael Hilstick still believes that the deaths of people who were not vaccinated from COVID is something to be mocked. And again, this just tells you how how ideologically blinkered these people are that you would still that you would have that opinion ever and that you would still hold that the deaths of innocent people should be mocked well the other thing too is is your use of substack which you know again is an outlet that the the the, those who (laughs) want to curtail first amendment rights could come after just like any other um but you are you you publish the exchange in advance of whatever he writes (laughs) so now there's a record of what the actual exchange was uh, yes. That could inform what he writes because he doesn't want to be, you know, essentially caught completely yeah, misrepresenting. I mean, and so it's just it's just a fascinating uh, that you you know you have the 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 platform that you've built enough such that you can hold uh, corporate media responsible in a way that a lot of people can't. Yeah, I mean, a great point. So I beat him at his own game, right? He sort of threatened to write something negative about me. All I published was our actual exchange to a quarter million people. And I beat him to that because he, you know, he has to wait a couple of days for the for the for his editors to sign off and the paper to come out. And I can just publish essentially immediately. And so it, it I think I hope <laughs> Alex Berenson, author of Pandemia, How Coronavirus Hysteria Took Over Our Government Rights and Lives. Again, his Substack, And now you know the value of it. If you didn't before, Unreported Truths, Alex Unreported Truths is the title of his Substack. Alex, thanks as always. Appreciate it. Dan and Amy, thanks so much. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.com.